this is advice that I have garnered by working in career coaching for about three years now, and through my own observations, job search, reading a lot of other people's opinions, etc. So take it with a grain of salt. Not everything here is something you're going to agree with, but it, I think it's coalescing a lot of advice that I think you won't get too many contradictory opinions on. So. I want to move ahead. Just a little bit about me. I've led product teams for about 25 years. Uh, I was in the laboratory instrument industry, built a $30 million business there out of software inside of an instrument company, so that was an interesting experience. I went looking for a job after working at one company for more than 20 years and not having done a lot of work on job search. Um, found it was a different thing than it was when I first got that job. A lot of things are the same though, so we'll focus on what is the same. I've uh, done three years of career coaching, started out at Lehigh Harrison, had about 150 clients there, and since then I've coached another 50 or so, so that's about 200 clients. About a third of my clients have landed within four months or so, so that's a pretty good rate. I'm currently keeping an eye out for another leadership position in pro software product management, because I miss uh, working with teams and I miss building products, but I'll keep doing the career coaching on the side, because I also enjoy that. It's a lot of fun to work with everybody. Everybody's got a the same problem, but a different situation, different set of tools to work with, and so I learned something from everybody I work with. Let's move along. What can a resume do? Thoughts? Discount you from the job. Discount you from the job, yes. <laughs> we'll get to that part, actually, <laughs> believe it or not. We're going to do that. What can a resume do? Get you Tell your story. You Tell your story. Get you an interview. Get you an interview. Potentially. What else? Include all the keywords that. Uh, <coughs> oh, we'll talk about keywords in a few moments. Connects you to other opportunities. Which is through the ATS system. Which is through the ATS. We'll talk about that. We will talk about keywords in ATS. Clean up coffee stains. Clean up coffee stains. <laughs> yes, you can get that wobbly table to stop wobbling. All right, well, here's my list. It can provide a summary of your qualifications, it may pique some interest. It could suggest that you might be a good fit for a job. It might prompt a recruiter or a hiring manager to contact you. And most importantly, it can provide a framework for a conversation. Give somebody something to talk about. What you should not expect your resume to do is get you a job. Why not? Well, because job search is a complex process. It's got a lot of moving parts to it, and the resume is just one tool. A good resume can help, but alone it's not enough to get you the job. So let's do a few reality checks on what resumes are and are not good for. Why you shouldn't rely too much on your resume. Number one, nobody hires based on a resume. Almost nobody. There's been a few companies that were hiring people so fast that they would skip. Just look at the resume if they look halfway decent, if the person could fog a mirror, they'd hire them, and then later <laughs> sort them out because they were just trying to deal with explosive growth. But in the vast majority of cases, almost every hiring decision is based on an interview. And if you don't get an interview, you're not going to get the job. The decision to interview you or not is only based on the resume in a small number of cases. There are usually other reasons people are inviting you to interview. We'll get to more about that in a moment. Reality check number two. Nobody reads your resume carefully except you. <laughs> They'll find the typos, but they won't remember the important stuff. So don't obsess too much on having the resume be perfect because it's not going to get actually read. The facts are that the first pass scan by a recruiter or a hiring manager is somewhere in the range of six to 10 seconds, depending on which source you look at. Six to 10 seconds. They reject most of the resumes that they get because they'll get a big stack of them, right? And they'll look twice at only 2% to maybe 10% of the resumes they get. So if you don't pass that first 10 second scan, you're out. Interviewers seldom are familiar with your resume. How many of you have gotten to, a, to an interview 
and had to hand them the resume because even though they were passed out, but they, and then they don't even seem to recognize what's in the resume. It looked like they're reading it for the first time in the interview. You expect them to be a little more prepared if they're actually trying to attract talent. But anyway. Number three, your resume might never even be seen. Who was here when Tom Brochot spoke about uh, three or four months ago? Yeah, some of you were here. Tom told us that you know the recruiters are handling a lot of different openings, the in-house recruiters. And we know that reviewing resumes is tedious. Who's a hiring manager? Who's been a hiring manager? Who's had to read through resumes? Would you rather have the root canal or the resume? <laughs> It's not a lot of fun because every one of them is different. Everyone's formatted differently. It's people representing themselves on a piece of paper as best they can, and some don't do it very well. It's really a slog to get through them. Now, the recruiter has the goal of getting candidates to the hiring manager. If enough promising candidates are found in the first subset of resumes, oh, here's 200 that came in for that product manager position, and in the first 25, I happen to find three or four that look pretty decent. Hey, I can shoot those off to the hiring manager and move on to the next rack because I've got 13 racks I'm trying to fill. So if they found enough in that first subset and yours was a little bit further down in the stack, it may never even get looked at. A sad reality. Reality check number four. It's not easy to beat the bots. A lot of people have gone through this uh, effort of doing keywords because a lot of companies put in software to start screening the resumes. And then candidates responded by putting keywords in and putting them in white text 100 times or so, so it would hopefully go up in the rankings. And then companies got wise to that, so they started looking for that. And certainly if you start making your resume look friendly to a machine, it'll start getting unfriendly to humans that are maybe looking at it a little later. The bots are getting smarter. I don't recommend spending a lot of time and effort on this. There are better ways to get a job than trying to play that game. <laughs> For that matter, is there any point to even having a resume with all these reality checks and the downsides of it? Why not just go to my LinkedIn profile? Here, let's connect on the phone and yeah, you can go read my LinkedIn profile. Well, it certainly helps you organize yourself. It helps you organize yourself. What else? Why might we still want a resume? You can personalize it to that role. You can personalize it to the role. What else? So you have, it's like your ID. If they want to see quickly who you are, what you are, and that's what you're doing. Okay, it's, it's kind of like an extension of the business card concept. Right. The business card is a really short thing. The resume gives an next level of detail. Oh, yeah, different audio effects here. Well. The main reason you need to have a resume, whoops, eh, that's all right, we'll get to that in a sec. Why not just a LinkedIn profile? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, in bold text here, I put what I consider to be the advantages of the resume versus the LinkedIn profile or vice versa. A resume, it's a controlled and limited distribution. Only the people you give the resume to, unless you post it on Monster or something like that, only the people you give it to are the ones who are going to see it. Whereas a LinkedIn profile is accessible to everybody. Because of that, the resume, resume works well offline. You don't need an internet connection. But you can also customize it for each situation, as Robert pointed out. LinkedIn profile, you only get one version. So if you're applying for two kind of different types of jobs, they use your skill set, but in completely different ways. You have to kind of make your LinkedIn profile as sort of catch-all and a little more generic, and then you can totally customize the resume for each one of those. You just have to make sure you have the resumes aligned to the profile. There's no formatting restrictions on the resume. You can do anything you want. You can make it into a postcard. You can make it into a you can make an electronic version of it. I've seen some pretty interesting demonstrations like that. Whereas LinkedIn, they limit your format pretty severely. <laughs> you can optimize the print version of the resume so it looks really good on a piece of paper. Whereas you print it off a LinkedIn profile, it's okay, but it's not great. Uh, resume, 
attachments are awkward, whereas on a LinkedIn profile, you can easily include online evidence. You can put on portfolio pieces. Here's a project I worked on. Here's the presentation I put together for this other. The other thing, here's the book I published, whatever. And the other thing about a LinkedIn profile is you can put the social proof on there. What do we mean by social proof? Endorsements. Endorsements. Recommendations. Press. This is people saying, I believe this person's good and putting their name to it in a very public way. So that's often more convincing than what you say about yourself, which is all they say in a resume. All right, but the real core reason that you real, really need to have a resume is because people expect it. You got a resume? Uh, no. You don't look good if you don't have it. A good resume in the right hands at the right time can help you move forward in the job search process. It's not, no, not usually the best way to start that process, but it helps you move along in the process. We'll talk about more about that in a sec. What is the best time to provide a resume to somebody? <laughs> oh, must have had an automatic in there. When it's requested. When they ask for it, think about it. If you submit an unsolicited resume, oh great, it goes into the stack, maybe I'll get through that stack or not. But if somebody's actually asking you for the resume, what are the chances they're actually gonna maybe look at it? You go up astronomically. Joe? So oftentimes there's an apply uh, site. An apply. It's basically them asking you to put what's on your resume in there. So how does that kind of work? Then you go into a, what I call an applicant trapping system, <laughs> <laughs> meaning you go in and you may never come out. But that is just putting you on file. So it's not a form of request at that point. That's I wouldn't consider that an actual request. That is just go ahead and feed your info in here. We'll stick it into our database, and if we ever come across it and want to look it up, it's there. <laughs> Storage is cheap, and you really haven't risen above the fray at that point. But if a hiring manager is actually asking for the resume, now here's a tip. If somebody says, hey, you seem pretty good. I know somebody in my company who's hiring for that. Do you have a resume? I say, sure, of course I have a resume, ready to go. But rather than having you deliver it to the hiring manager, it would probably be better if, I, I really prefer to hand it over myself in person, but I will go ahead and fill out a little referral card so you get the bonus if I, happy to get hired, and go ahead and, ahead and put in a good word for me, but I'd really prefer to hand it over. Why do you want to do that? Because you make that first impression. You get that chance to meet the person, and most people decide within five seconds, 10 seconds, whether they like somebody or not. Why not get that part of things out of the way first? If they like you, and they want to talk to you some more about it after seeing the resume and hearing the recommendation, great, you're further along in the job search process. If they decide they don't want to like it, hey, cut things off early, save your time and their time. Get that out of the way. All right, so look for those insiders who will refer you. But when they do, ask to deliver the resume to the appropriate person yourself so you can make that first impression. So which strategy is more effective? Submitting your resume to HR or filling out the application, hoping that you get noticed and selected amid all the others that are there, or using your resume as a supporting document for a conversation that you've already achieved obtaining through other means. I'm going with number two, and that is the one that lands in most people their jobs. So you do need a resume, and it should look good, just don't expect it to carry all the weight, because that's a lot to ask a piece of paper to do. How can you get that conversation with the hiring manager? How can you get that chance? Several ways. You could cold call, just figure out who they are, and then do a direct outreach via telephone, via email. You can focus on a presumed pain issue. You can congratulate them for something you've seen they've done or comment about something you found on their LinkedIn profile, etc. And really position yourself as a solution to a presumed problem that they have. Oh, I've seen you growing really fast. You must be needing you open up some new channels, I've opened up channels, da 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 and so you position yourself as a solution to the problem. Now, cold calling 
any salesperson will tell you has a pretty low success rate overall. So you have to make a lot of cold calls in order to get very many connections and conversions. Much better is a warm call. There you're doing a direct outreach after you've first established some kind of communication. So this might be, you followed this person for a while. Maybe you met them at, a, at one of these events or at some other meetup that you've gone to. It might have been the featured speaker there. You had a little conversation afterwards. Or maybe you noticed they posted an interesting article. You posted some comments on there. They liked your comments. You've opened up some kind of a communication channel with them, and now you're just following up and expanding on that channel. Much more likely to get an interaction with that person than with a cold call. Of course, the best is a referral where somebody they trust is introducing you and suggesting they talk to you. Especially if that person you're talking to sees your value, recognizes your value, and communicates that to the hiring manager. So that's how you can get that conversation with the hiring manager. All right, so that's how to use a resume. Let's get down and start using our resumes right now. Let's take a look at what shape they're in. Uh, the meeting announcement asks you to bring four copies of your resume. I know that some of you didn't do that, but for those who did, please pull them out now because we're going to do a little exercise. And you two stranded ones up at the table there, maybe it's best if you join one of the groups to get the resume. It'd be interesting. Okay, so what we're going to do is something called rapid resume reconnaissance. You are now either a very busy hiring manager who's way behind, and the only reason you're getting to hire somebody is because you've got a problem, you can't keep up, and you need to find somebody to fill this opening that just got granted to you after the begging and pleading of the higher ups. But you don't have a lot of time. Or maybe you're that recruiter that we talked about who has 10 to 12 openings that they're trying to source candidates for. You've got 10 seconds to look at a resume, right? So start with all the resumes face down and grab some, grab one or two of those sticky notes that are on your table. Here's how this works. In a moment, we'll pass one resume to the neighbor on your left and one to the neighbor on your right. When I give the signal, you'll have 10 seconds to look at that resume. Just the 10 seconds that a recruiter or hiring manager might have. And use the sticky notes to jot your main impressions. What do you notice? What are the things that hit you when you look at that other person's resume? And affix that to the back. And then. We'll do it a second time with that second resume that you got, okay? And then, of course, we return the resume to their rightful owners with the stickies that have the comments. This is just to give you an idea of what people are seeing when they take that 10-second look at your resume. All right. Are we ready? I gotta get out of here. I gotta time you for 10 seconds. You won't believe how fast 10 seconds goes. <laughs> Any questions before we start? Start with the face down. And then flip them over when you say, ready? 10 seconds, go. Stop. That's it. <laughs> Turn your resumes back over and write what you noticed on the sticky note. Now you only have one resume you were looking at. Imagine if you were going through a stack of them like this. What are you going to remember? You can get a moment to jot a couple more notes on there. right. But this is the reality you're facing. A resume is not a big essay. People will not read it. They scan. On a second pass, they might scan it for 
30 seconds or a minute. But on the first pass, it's 10 seconds. They're in, they're out. Okay. Does anyone need more time yet? All right, let's go to the second resume. Ready? Go! Stop. That's 10 seconds. And remember, some of them only scan for six seconds. So we're going for the high side, the 10 second side. Please jot your impressions on there, put them on the sticky note, fix that to the back of the resume, and get the resume back to whoever owns it. something to contribute. Good God. <laughs> Ten seconds. You're going to read that really Maybe the first third of the page. First third of the page, which means what's important to Alan or the resume. Something that's eye-catching in the first third. Something eye-catching in the top third. The top third of the resume is a really important piece of real estate. Most recently, you might skim and catch a few job titles. What else? Who else has a comment? The more content, the more densely content. Absolutely. The most common problem you see with resumes is they have too much content. Most people need to cut out anywhere between 30 and 80 percent of the resume content in order to make it effective. Saying it's not, it's not the encyclopedia Britannic version of your career, and it's not the Cliff Notes version of your career, it's the cover of the Cliff Notes version. It's the cover of the Cliff Notes, well said. <laughs> Any other thoughts somebody would like to share? That is a, well, a billboard in Wyoming, not a billboard down here in the Bay Area. <laughs> have plenty of time to study that. And, uh, go through the footnotes. And, uh, no. No. Good analogy, though. A billboard is about the right kind of mentality you want to have for this. So we'll get into some. The next section, we'll talk about how to structure a resume, and we'll get into some of the ideas around design that might help you make that a little better. Any closing thoughts on this exercise before we go on? I was, I was really impressed with the, the, the sentence here. Notice the gap between my previous role and the current one. So it was interesting to see that he honed in on that. Found Fair the negative right, right away. Found the negative right <laughs> away. But, but more, like, clearly, like, his strategy was first thing I'm going to do, or one of the things, is I'm going to look at dates. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. Easily parsable, easily scannable, and I'm coming to conclusions based on that. Yeah, well, you got to bury that uh, gap a little better. <laughs> <laughs> there are ways to manage these issues. Lots of people have issues on the resumes, and nobody's perfect, so we just do the best we can. All right. How can you make your resume compelling? Well, is everyone here who got something really good out of the resume they looked at, or saw notes on theirs that made them feel a little better about the resume? Nobody? Uh, all right. Well, here's some things we can do to make a resume more compelling. Let's start with some of the basics. First of all, it is a summary, not a treatise. You've got to keep it simple. Think billboard. Don't think document. Big document. Be clear and be direct. Avoid the passive voice. Use the direct voice and be really clear and concise. Minimize the jargon, etc. Make the essentials prominent. This is that top third of the resume we were just talking about a moment ago. You need to have your name on there. You must provide your contact info. You want to make sure it's easy to find, but don't make it the main point. They want to know they can get a hold of you, but just don't let it take too much attention away from everything else. The target job title. Can you tell me how many times I've seen a resume that didn't have a job title on it? Now imagine yourself a hiring manager. Here's a person. 
Here's a whole bunch of qualifications, and I have no idea what job they're looking for. Either they're fear of commitment, they don't want to put that job down there, I'll do anything. Or they don't have the focus and they want me to figure it out for them. Well, I'm already busy as can be, I'm overloaded, I'm not going to take the time to figure it out. So make sure your job, target job title is on there. And in compelling summary, that is how you hook them in that top third of the resume. That's what you got to put in there. That summary needs to be tight, concise, and really speak to where the hiring manager's need is. Do it. Good. Yeah. Okay. You know, you don't actually need to worry about taking pictures of all this because I am going to provide you uh, some links to articles that have everything in here and more. So that'll uh, fill in all these details for later. Do you want questions now or later? You can take them now, sure. So when you say target job title, do you mean? All right. How do you want it expressed? Let, if you are, let's say, what's your current role? Product manager. Product manager. All right. Do you want to remain a product manager? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to become a senior product manager? Oh. Are you already qualified to become a senior product manager? If you are, that's the title you should put on there if that's the job you're going for. If you're not qualified for it, don't say VP of product management when you're a junior product associate product manager. You're just going to be disqualifying yourself. Yes. You, I assume you want to customize it if you can for the position that's open. It's good to do that. Um, customizing takes work. So yeah. if you're submitting it against a published requisition, yeah, you probably should customize because otherwise you're going to get rejected pretty quickly if you don't have to align pretty well with the previous expectations. But there's a difference in the mentality and the approach. Remember we talked about trying to get the conversation first. You want to go from the model of, hmm, I'm submitting a resume along with a pile of others, and now they're looking for a reason to reject every one of these resumes. We're looking for a reason to reject. Whereas if instead you can get that conversation with somebody who refers you to that hiring manager, and you have a conversation, and they decide they like you, and they dig a little deeper, and they find you have skills that can solve the problems that they have, and you've got evidence of that, all of a sudden the interest level has gone way up. Now they're interested in you because they see you as a solution. Instead of trying to find ways to reject you, they're trying to find ways to get you in. And that changes the game entirely. Uh, could you say more about the summary? What, what the summary, the yes, we'll get right to that. <clears throat> the other basic is focus on accomplishments. Don't focus on the roles and responsibilities as much. You can include a little bit about that, but tell the story through the accomplishments you've had in those roles rather than explaining what it is your employer does and what your assignments were, because that's really what responsibilities are, is assignments. Show where you took initiative. Show where you had great <coughs> accomplishments, turned in results that mattered. And don't get into this habit of saying, oh, I'm a wonderful person, because nothing turns, turns off hiring managers like unsubstantiated claims. Let's look at the um, overall thing. We'll get to the summary in a sec. The overall journey. Who here has designed a brochure before? Done some product marketing, right? What's the first thing you do? You write all the copy, right? Mm -hmm. And you take all the pictures and everything. No, the first thing you do is you figure out, is this a four page, two page, six, eight, 12? Is it gonna be a six page, eightfold kind of thing? What's this gonna look like? So you start mapping it out, and then you start sketching. What are the major themes and sections? Page one will be, a, or page two, three will be a nice opening spread that will introduce you to the product. Maybe pages uh, three, sorry, four or five. We'll spread four or five. We'll get into some of the technical details of this or that, or maybe a market segment. Next spread will be about this, and maybe we'll have a closing spread with a call to action at the end. You map this kind of stuff out before you ever start writing the copy because you need to know how much copy to have and where it belongs and how to have the voice go through. Do the same thing with your resume. Plan that journey. What you're trying to do with a resume is get somebody to get hooked at the beginning. They see the job title, say, yeah, I need one of those. And they see a compelling summary that pays off that job title. Ah, yeah, it looks like you're qualified to do that job. And you build a story with evidence that supports you as a candidate, that gives you that credibility. 
So in that summary, you're going to include the first bits of evidence, and it's going to start looking pretty interesting. Then they're going to want to go down and look at the prior jobs you've done and some evidence of what you've accomplished in those. As you draw them down, you're going to reveal the details successfully. Like when you read a newspaper article, they don't tell the whole story in the first paragraph. They'll tell a short form of it, then they'll tell a slightly more expanded form, and then they'll start filling in more details, etc. In case you have to keep reading the article, you're going to learn more. Do the same thing with the resume. You're doling it out at the rate they want to get it. If you hit them with too much at once, you'll lose them. And keep enticing them to keep exploring for additional evidence. Because that's the one thing they're looking for in a resume is evidence. They're not looking for claims. They're looking for evidence. So what is the content to include? The essentials are your name, your contact information, target job title, summary, work experience, and education. There's a large number of optionals that you could put in there. But the thing to remember about optionals is that everything you include in a resume takes attention away from everything else that's in your resume. That's why a really packed resume is ineffective. It's got too much. They don't know what to focus on. And they're going to miss the stuff that you think is most important because of something that wasn't, like your hobbies. So use your judgment about these things. Skills lists make sense if, for example, you're an engineer with a specialization in networking protocols or something like that. Yeah, go ahead and list those protocols. But don't make it the top line of your resume. Put it down near the bottom. Instead, focus attention more on some of the major problems you've solved and some of the results you've generated. Content not to include. Who's seen objective on a resume? To gain employment for money. <laughs> objective. I really want to take over your job, yeah, ultimately. I want to move into your position. It has no value to the employer. That is what you want. Focus on what they want. The description of the employers that you've worked at. I've seen people burn up a quarter of the resume just explaining what it was that Cisco Systems does for a living. It's like, no, they can look that up. Even if it was a startup, you can imply that in an accomplishment statement where you're talking about yourself instead of talking about the employer. Vertical space is especially hard to to reclaim, so don't burn it up on talking too much about your employer. Of course, you want to avoid any private information. Many states prohibit disclosure or prohibit asking about these things, so why would you volunteer that information? And then references available. Gee, really? <laughs> of course they are. You don't need to put that on the resume. How about this? Should you include this on your resume? A statement like this. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I see this on somebody, as the opening line on somebody's LinkedIn summary or on the resume. What does it mean? Should you include that? Why not? Marketing. It's not even marketing to me. That's an insult to marketers. <laughs> All right, well, it's generic. It offers no value. Results are a professional. Oh, I knew you were a professional by the fact that you said you were a product manager, right? Okay? Results oriented. If you're not results oriented, then how have you ever held this job? Demonstrated history of working in the industry. Ah, I've been there. I've been in the industry. So what? You were there. You showed up. You punched the clock. What did you get done? It doesn't say a word about that. Main thing is that it's boring. It does not distinguish you from anybody else. It does not deliver any value. And they're looking for value. They're looking for evidence and value. All right, so what to include in the summary? You want one to three very short paragraphs. Very short, why? People don't read. People don't read. Paragraphs. Paragraph can be two lines. Could be one sentence. When I say one to three, very short, I mean very short. A two-line paragraph or a one-line paragraph is the best because it's super easy to read. You glance at it, you've already absorbed it. Three lines takes a little more work, but it can be worth it if it's appropriate. But notice I said one to three. 
very short paragraphs. A one-liner and a two-liner, or a two-liner and a three-liner, that's, that's adequate for a summary. And that's enough to set that hook to provide enough interest. You want to cover the depth of experience. You want to cover the key job functions, a few of them, not all of them. Hint as to your domain or specialty. And cite a key accomplishment or two. Here's an example. A one-liner. This is one line when formatted on an 8.5 by 11 resume. 15 years leading sales and marketing teams in medical device and pharmaceutical industries. Okay, we got the time. We got the major job function. We got the domain. We don't have a key accomplishment there. That comes in the second paragraph. Built 11 sales teams focused on medical specialties. Ah, digging to that next layer, right? Encompassing women's health. Ah, a specialty within that medical device and pharmaceutical area. Identified market opportunities consistently exceeded revenue targets, an accomplishment. And market share goals, another accomplishment. Cultivated and maintained strategic partnerships. Oh, really? So when I read a summary like this, I'm going to start looking for that next bit of evidence. Prove it. So I'm going to read down and look at the experience section and see what kind of results. What do you mean exceeded revenue targets? By how much is my next question. And if I find that right away, I, my interest keeps going up. So Jim, these are not full sentences in many ways. These are just uh, they, don't, they don't usually include a subject. That's a way of keeping it short. I built 11 teams. Well, yeah, I know it's you. It's your resume. Okay, but this is enough to get the point across. Remember, be simple and direct. That's pretty direct. I'll show you a, a resume that actually has more of that stuff in it a little bit later. Work experience section. So choose either a chronological format, which is the most common, sometimes called the obituary version, <laughs> or the functional format. When would you use a functional format? As in, I did this kind of a role, maybe at several em different employers. I was a typesetter, and then a copy editor, and then a publisher. Going after a very specific job, job and transition. Transition, or when you're going after a specific job. Another reason to do it is maybe you have a little gap in your employment, and you're trying not to highlight that, so a chronological resume makes that really easy to spot, where it's a functional. However, most hiring managers figure out that, well, if you're doing a functional resume, there's probably a reason, so. Most common is the chronological. Either one works, just depends on whether you have the evidence in there and you can make it compelling. Keep each of the sections concise. Emphasize the title and the accomplishments more than the employer, the date, and the responsibilities. I suggest get all that, get all this stuff on one line, and not really the responsibility of the employer, the date, and what your job title was. Get that all in one line. And then spend most of your time talking about the accomplishments. We talked about employer. In the earlier slide, you talked about not having to you know, spend so much real estate on describing what the employer does. Yeah, you just cite. Often that is a shorthand for, you now Cisco is a well-known brand, right? Yeah. You know about Cisco, and most of the you talk about a smaller startup. Sure. A small company, and who the heck is this company? That's right. So you have to spend some time. Advantech about, Systems. Right. In Corp LLC. Yeah, what right. do you do, right? So what do you do? So you, you say product manager, mm -hmm. new markets or whatever, Advantech Systems LLC, wherever it was located. And dates, maybe off to the right. Go right into talking about what you did there. Build out the channel for, of, for whatever kinds of products they made, uh, open up new markets and da, da 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 Tell the story of what they do through what you did, but make sure it's focused on your accomplishments there. Generated $30 million in, in five years by doing this, that, and the other thing. And then you can maybe hint a little bit about the customers that were involved, the products that were involved, et cetera, to where they can figure out what the business is. And guess what? If they're still curious, they'll look it up. Okay. But this is your resume. Focus on you. <laughs> All right, uh, quantitate the results whenever possible. That sounds like the real numbers, right? And begin with the simple task notes. So achieve, created, built, led, you know, these kinds of words. There's 
dozens of them that you can use. But focus on those really powerful words that speak to your accomplishments. In the work experience, limit the number of bullets per section. How many bullets can you put under a specific experience section before people stop reading it? Who's got an opinion about that? Three? Three? Bullet three? Three to five? Most recent uh, job five and then four, three, two, one. So when I was at Lee Hector Harrison, I'd keep a big file of actual resumes people had handed me, and I would just say, hey, how's that list? How's that list? Would you read that? Would you read that? And what I generally found was people would say, okay, I'll read it if it's three two-line bullets or if it's up to five one-line bullets. Any more than that, I'm not even going to look at it. People just get into overload. So that, that's my empirical, empirically derived numbers, just asking job seekers what they thought. If you had a long time at one company, like 20 years plus that I had at one company, break that into sections. Talk about your different roles in there. Talk about the promotions that you had between those. Well, don't talk about the promotions, but imply the promotions by showing that you had some movement within that one company. You weren't just a fossil or a fixture, you had some action going on, you had some accomplishments, and you had some promotion. The other nice thing about that is, when you break it into the sections, guess what, you get more total bullets that you can put in there. You can talk about your product marketing credit, you can talk about your product management credit, you can talk about working with the salespeople or working with manufacturing folks or whatever it was. It gives you a chance to tell more of the story than if you only had one section. Jim, why do you say to list only years for the dates? Because months is too fine a resolution to worry about. If you have had a 20-year career, then getting it down to the month is more detail. Plus, it, it just looks more complicated on the resume and draws attention to something that's really not that important. So recommend just stick to the, the years that you were at certain places. Yes? Does anybody still print these out? Look at them, or are they looking at them online? The reason I ask is for things like font size. Both, both happen. Um, most people prefer to handle the paper still, in my experience, in that you're not staring at the screen, burning your eyes, etc. You do want to pay attention to fonts and such. It's not the most important thing, but you want to present nicely. So what I experience a lot of times when they come to the interview, they come to the paper, because they also want to write notes like this. True. So having a paper version makes sense. It's also handy for that. Thanks. Ali? And the other thing is, even if you submit it electronically, when it comes to interview, the, the interviewer will often want a hard copy. Yeah, they won't usually be trying to read their screen while they're trying to talk to you. It's more convenient to have a piece of paper in front that they can scribble the notes on and not feel like they're disengaging with you as much as they would have if they were scrolling on the screen. So, good point. Thank you. Um, I don't recommend nesting multiple zi positions under one employer. So if you were at Cisco for four years, or sorry, for uh, 14 years, and you have three, four different positions, don't put Cisco systems and then this job, this job, turn over the page, this job, this job, this job, because they'll lose the reference that it was all Cisco. Instead, it just goes, Sis uh, this job, Cisco systems, dates, this job, Cisco systems, dates. In other words, spell it out explicitly. It doesn't take any more space, but it also keeps people from getting lost. All right. Before we get to resume exercise two, I want to show you some resumes and get your thoughts on those. So let's see if I can get to those. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Can I ask you one other question? Um, is it still appropriate to write locations? Of, um... Oh, let's talk about locations. Do you want to put uh, in your contact information, do you want to put your street address? No. no. Yeah. Why not? Google Street View. Anybody use Google Street View? <laughs> Anybody ever look up somebody that they had the address of and go, oh, that's a white crappy car in China. <laughs> <laughs> Two kids, I see, or whatever. Takes up space. Yeah, takes up space. It's giving away information you should. Now, should you put the city on there? Yes. yes. Depends. Right now, I'm going to interviews, and one of the top three questions that 
people who are physically who are exacerbated, where do you need? Because they wanted to see how much, it, how long these more are Yeah. So this is big for me. Is that your business or out of their business? Well, because I, I, they I asked for a lot of them. They said because the higher people, if they come meet, is long after the two months or a year they need. Yeah. So that's one of the top three questions that well, constantly get. Right? If that is what the market is demanding, then I would deliver to that market. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't get into that part of the discussion too early. Just like you don't want to start talking about the salary or the compensation package before you even know what the responsibilities of the job are and, and all that sort of thing. That was actually something we heard last year as well in the recruiter panel. Was that, was, that was becoming a major challenge from the recruiting side. Uh, the inverse, right? It was essentially people looking at where the role was and saying, nope. I'm not, I'm not recruiting her and self-opting out. So it's actually a problem for both sides. It can be, but it depends on whether they need you to show up at the office or not. Right. And it's also up to you as to what you're willing to tolerate. Maybe if the job's great, maybe you're willing to take the train up to the city every day and back. Uh, I've, also, I've noticed that some of the opportunities will list different cities, and you never quite know. <clears throat> um, that's true. Opportunities may notice different cities. Another thing is if you... We can get into the details of contract info. You know, if you have an out of area area code, somebody might think, oh, you're in New York, never mind. I'm not gonna fly you out here or whatever, or move you out here. No, no, I already moved out here, but you kept the old phone number. You talk about email addresses, it's a good idea to use a Gmail or something that looks a little more contemporary than that Hotmail or AOL or that makes you look a little dated. So you want to be careful, you know, the Yahoo, oh, they didn't spring for real, you know, et cetera. So you gotta be a little careful about how you brand yourself using the, um, so here, for example, the Gmail was used, because hey, everybody's using Gmail, and you can always create a throwaway account just for your job search, and keep it focused on that. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we were talking about cities and such. If you're out of the area, that could make some somebody just disregard you right away. On the other hand, if you're close, it may or may not provide an advantage. Use your judgment on that one. All right, let's take a look at a few resumes. What do you observe when you look at this one? This is one of the early ones that I got from somebody. A lot of keywords. A lot of keywords. We don't have page up, page down, I forgot. Just a two finger slide. Oh, thanks. Yeah, there we go. Are you going to read this? How about if we zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole thing? Uh, just pinch. Just pinch? Oh, okay. I tried that. Didn't. Uh. Oops. Let's try Alt Tab again. There we go. Are we in there? Oh, there it is. I see it. Now can I get to it? Woo! You're obviously a PC Sorry, Jim. For many, many years. <laughs> yeah, navigate that thing, will you? Here, I'll, I'll stand here and be your zoom us, uh, zoom us out a little bit so we can actually see this. Scotty, thing. zoom us out. There we go. Keep going, zoom out. Look at the whole page. Let's take that macro view like we're laying out the brochure. What do you observe? Okay, we have boxes. I see a summary box, I see a career progression box. And I see, if I squint, I can see testimonials. How many different fonts can you count? Holy Way cow. too many, right? Way too many sizes, etc. How about airspace? Can we get any air in here? No, we're right on top of that box. Boy, we crammed that thing in. Boy, we have such good stuff to say about ourselves. Okay, so you can see it's an overload. Let's switch to another resume, shall we? Zoom out on again. Uh, that's good right there. Okay. How are we doing for space? A little bit a little better. Vertical. We have a skills list kind of thing or a bullet thing. Are you feeling a little jargon heavy here? Yeah. Is it a technical role? Sir, desk integration engineer, design and else about. Okay, okay, I get it. It, it maybe belongs. Uh, it looks a little cramped here. I could use a little air space between this and this. What else do we have? A lot of space. A little, little, little more space between this and before you start hitting me with the details. Are we gonna read all these bullets? No. Nope. Too many for that experience section, so let's cut it down a little bit. This is the format I was talking about. Sys Cisco Systems, that's echoed here again, so I didn't have to remember it was Cisco and then two rolls under it. 
um, needs to choose which of the children is most important in, you know, <laughs> off the other ones. <laughs> really, you gotta make those economic choices. Because it's not gonna get read anyway. They'll, none of them will get read if you put too many in, so choose the most important ones. Mike. What else? What else? If you look at the formatting on the second line of the title, the formatting is just off. Notice there's no justification over yeah. here. So and some I'm things could be done. I would improve the size, of, I would increase the size of this, make the name stand out. I would also increase the size of this, make that pop, put a little space between this and this. If you put this right next to this, it's taking attention away from the summary. You start reading the summary and then all of a sudden all these bullets catch your attention. So I would move this to the bottom of the resume and just try to get this the focus. My pet mm -hmm. peeve, all these hanging sentences. You couldn't use all the space and you couldn't chop it down. So all these, all these uh, bullets that have like three, lo three words or four words on a new line. So you oh, waste- Oh, these. Yeah. Yeah. Figure out a way to avoid those wraps. And then just a couple word things. Just so try another one. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. All caps, is that, if you use all caps, let's say for your name or for the job title, is that? All caps can be like shouting, so be careful with that. I would not recommend doing your name in all caps. Um, yeah. It can be a personal choice, though. Maybe maybe you feel it represents you well. Just try another one. I'll watch small cap. <laughs> what are you, E.E. E. Cummings? Yeah. <laughs> go, go ask some opinions. Ask some opinions of some actual hiring managers, how they react to it. Try it on. What about bolding certain phrases or words that you want If to it's done judiciously, that can work pretty well. What do you see about the format of this one? <laughs> Too much white space at the top. Too much white space at the top. That's called a margin. <laughs> uh, where, how many employers did you work at? Six so far. Three. Two. Oh, two. 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 I see two. Any other, any other guesses? Two. Two. One. This company got acquired by this one. She just stayed on. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes a title change, it makes a job change, and it makes it look like she progressed in her career. She broke up this chunk of time at Bayer and this chunk of time at Berlex into different roles. So now she gets to put in four or five small bullets on each. She went to six there. That's all. But it doesn't look too heavy because they're really short. So she got away with it. Plenty of spacing. Do you see any uh, evidence in there? I see numbers from here. Top you may have 10. recognized this stuff up at the top that I was talking about from before. She put it in these. I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't have bothered putting these in. Actually, I would have gotten right to the evidence. Led the team to a number one national rank. Nationally ranked in top ten in two years. Uh, nationally ranked in top twenty-five percent. Team of direct ten direct reports. Managed seven direct reports. The numbers make things pop and they catch your attention. So I, I keep Joe? going going back to the job title because I have to admit this is something new for me. Uh, I've never I've never thought about putting the, the job title outside of uh, experience section. What I've done. Oh, this is the experience section. No, very she top. just didn't label it experience. Very top. Very top. Sales and marketing so leader. Oh yeah, this is the job title she wants. Because okay. it doesn't have well, it's not that. exactly what they're going to hire for, but mm -hmm. she's positioning herself for the job she wants. Mm -hmm. Now, it may have a different title. It might be director of sales, or it might be okay. director of marketing, or something like that. But that's an equivalent there, and she's got the evidence. Am I a leader? Yeah. Here's here's evidence that pays that off, and built eleven sales teams. Blah blah blah. Makes me want to look down, get more evidence collected, etc. Now, if you look at the second page, it's a two-page resume, but everything on the second page is just gravy. She told really all the story you needed in the first page. This is just adding other things. There's some courses I took, here's some awards I won, some affiliations, and some volunteering. That's nice. A one-page resume. It was pretty much a one-page resume. So when does City this information really come or matter? I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there you want to... A lot of companies like to see people yeah. who uh, donate their time, so that one matters. Showing that you're learning and growing isn't a bad thing. She has the space to be able to tell that story, and certainly the social proof or the third-party corroboration that she's an achiever yeah. is a good thing. Patents, publications. Yeah, exactly. 
Let's try another one or two. How far do you go in your career? Uh, so you might have started Ah, uh, good question. There's a lot of debate around that. If you're a banker, there is an advantage to saying you've been in the business 25 years. If you are in tech, that could be a death sentence if you're trying to get a job at Facebook or LinkedIn or Google or something because they're not interested in hiring people. There is ageism out there. So the general recommendation is go back 10 or 15 years if that's appropriate. And depending on the industry, maybe going a little further may not be a bad thing. If you're looking for that senior VP role, I expect you to have more than 10 years of experience. I expect to see some a little bit. But you don't have to go into the earliest parts of your career. You can save that for the conversation. Remember, what you're trying to do with the resume is stimulate the conversation, stimulate interest, not tell the whole story. Get them interested enough that they want to talk to you, and then they'll ask those questions. How about this one? Can you zoom out? Is that a full page? Comment on the ageist thing. Yeah. Your experience may not be the full range, but check your education dates. Who includes uh, their yeah, education you may dates? Not include those, depending. Like, wherever. Is this a European resume? Uh, no, this was an American. Um, you gonna read this resume? Uh, is this designed to be eleven? Is this eight and a half by eleven? Is this legal format? It, it was. It was. No, it, was eight, it fit on eight and a half by eleven. Believe it or not. So this guy got a great job, despite the resume. <laughs> you got a B, uh, director of VP of product management for a company up in the Seattle area. Really nice guy. Doesn't get the concept of too many bullets. <laughs> he has great experience, but he says too much about it, and because of that, can't read it. Another one. Jim, I noticed most of these are in that one. format. Do you recommend submitting a price in Word or PDF? Um, I just have them in Word. Okay. Um, you know, this is so this is the first resume, the resume of the first person I ever had as an official client. What's, what do you notice? What's the first thing you notice? Bleeds. Oracle. Works for Oracle, right? No. That's what you're saying. It's Oracle certified. What job does he want? Seeking challenging position. That's an objective statement. Don't do that. Just put, just put what he does. If he said big data architect, that would have worked great, but he put too much stuff there. This goes on for four pages, and it's got Hadoop and big data, no SQL environments, and Spark, and, uh, and it's got more jargon in here than you can shake a stick at. I got this guy to tell some stories instead. He had some amazing stories I was able to pull out of him that were powerful accomplishments with lots of money generated, money saved, much more interesting than this. So this wasn't helping him at all. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, let's take a look at is there one more? Uh, we, yeah. Oh, yeah, this one. What about this one? How's this one? There's some space. You're starting to get the idea. Uh, sub bullets are The bullets weird. are getting a little long there. Sub bullets under bullets. Uh, do we need that? Yeah. Get the idea. All right, so let's take a look at your I have a about uh, section separators and a couple of those resumes. Oh, yeah. Either the lines. Horizontal lines or whatever, okay. highlighting. The lines can sometimes confuse scanners if they're scanning your resume into an applicant tracking system, but it, they certainly help with. Now, here you got to worry about if you run that on a copier, it's going to go black and you'll lose the white. You know, issues like that can come up when you start getting fancy. Um, I like the idea of using separator lines and not bothering to put this is now my work experience section we'll be talking about, and here is my education can figure that out. If you just separate the sections, they'll figure out what's in them, right? It doesn't need to say summary. The fact that it is up at the top and it's short and concise, no clue in. You want that? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, so we've been here, and we've been down through this stuff. Let's get down to... There we go. Let's get down to exercise two. All right. Resume's at the table again. We're gonna have 30 seconds this time. And this time, you've already been through the first pass on the resume. Uh, you can you can do the same resumes, or actually, why don't you uh, go to the left, or do the right, or something like that. Actually, we're gonna pass them all the way around.
So just go, go, go one to the left and we'll, uh, we'll go to the left the second time. So here's, here's the way it works. Start with all the resumes face down. Upon signal, you're going to pass, well, we'll pass the resume to the neighbor, I guess, on the right. Let's do it on the right. Neighbor on the right. Pass the resume to the neighbor on the right. Keep the resume face down for now. And then you're going to have 30 seconds to decide why you should reject this resume. <laughs> I will give you a list on the next slide of reasons you can reject the resume. Okay. Once we, once we take 30 seconds on that first resume you're looking at, and you, you can uh, decide to reject it or not, you pass it to the right. We don't need to use the sticky notes this time. You can just write directly on the resume. And we'll continue passing them around until you get your own resume back. Now, here are the reasons you can reject the resume. The layout. It's too dense. As in, I'm not going to read this. It's misaligned. We saw examples of misaligned. The font's too small. There's no white space. So something in the layout's a problem. Or essentials are missing. Doesn't have a name, the job title, the contact info. The summary is either missing or too long or not focused. The wording, it's either too complex, self-laudatory. I am a really great performer. <laughs> I really can get along with everybody. Or cliche, results-oriented professionals. Jargon, or any typos. You can reject based on that for the wording. And then I said proof, which is evidence. Missing or hard to find or unquantified. I use P because we already have E used for essentials. So if you spot any of these problems on that resume, just write the letter that corresponds to the section, or to the problem that you found in that spot on the resume and you're done. If you can find more than one, even better. Okay? So now we're getting harsh, because this is the way people are looking at your resume. So let's see how, uh, how your resume does. I'll get the timer out again. And when you're ready, we'll have 30 seconds. Ready, go. First resume. Look for a reason to reject it. That's 10 seconds, you have 20 more. Ten seconds left. All right, that's 30 seconds. Did any resume survive? <laughs> no, 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 oh, too bad. Okay, pass it to the right and we'll do it again. You'll get a different person's opinion. Now this time you have to find a new reason. If somebody already marked it with, uh, with one of these, you have to find a uh, new category reason to reject it. All right. Ready? Go. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. And done. All right. Any resume survive a second round? No resumes have gotten through. <laughs> What is this telling us? First of all, you get, think any of us are employed? <laughs> well, you get the idea of, first of all, how much time people are giving or not giving to looking at the resume and how harshly they will look at it. All right, pass it to the right. Let's do it again. Find a new category to reject. Go. <laughs> 
10 seconds left. And done. All right, has any resume not had a new problem found? Yeah. Did anybody fail to find a reason to reject a resume? They're all fired. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is tough. All right. The next resume, are you, you got it in front of you? Here we go. Start. Ten seconds left. All right, done. How are we doing with this? You getting quicker at looking at residents? No. I'm not starting to enjoy this. L. E. Remember, you have to pick a new category that somebody hasn't already rejected it for. That was a good one. Yeah, I like this one. All right, got a new resume in front of you. Here we go. One or two more rounds. Go. Pretty soon your own resume should be coming back to you with a tragic tale. 20 seconds from Thank you. Ten seconds Okay, let's go one more time here. Pretty soon your room should be coming back. And go. If, you, if you've got your own, then you, you're done. We're going to start looking at that. Ten, uh, 20 seconds left here. <laughs> Ten seconds. Mm. All right, we're done. If you don't already have your resume back, please uh, hand the resume back to whoever wrote it. And read it and we. <laughs> Is there anyone who got through any of the, anyone whose resume got through any of the rounds of screening? Yeah. All right. Of the resumes you looked at, what, kind of thing, what were the most significant problems you saw? Too much information. No job titles. Cliches. What kind of cliches did you observe? Oh, magnificent. So that's self-auditory stuff. Yeah. If you, if you position yourself as the superman, uh, okay. yeah, sorry, the you need to let the evidence speak for itself. Let other people say that and let the evidence do it. No need to start bragging because it, it comes across as bragging. I don't know what you believe in anyway. So it's yeah. yeah. summary. What were the issues with the summary? A wall of text in the summary was a few. If you all spotted something or noticed something that they would recommend against. I, I saw that like two many people. Two many people. Yes. 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 All right, so hopefully this exercise gave you a little bit of a feeling for what it's like to be on the other side of the table receiving that resume and maybe make you a little better marketer of yourself. So why don't we bring around home?
We'll have a little time for other questions afterwards. So what we want to do is create an attractive, easy to read, personal marketing document. That's really what this is. It's a personal marketing document. It's a brochure. And like any brochure, it's going to be received with a certain amount of skepticism. Your job is to give somebody enough evidence, compelling evidence, that they're going to be willing to talk to you, ask you questions about it, dig a little deeper. They're not going to believe everything in the resume. They've seen people lie in their resumes before, but if you've got compelling evidence that they can ask about, then you've got a story to tell. And you've got a reason for them to talk to you. I recommend to use your resume mainly to support conversations that you've already arranged through other means, not as your primary means of getting those conversations. Because your hit rate on submitting a resume and getting to a conversation is going to be extremely low. Much more effective to get a referral, get it through your networking, find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And if you can't find anybody, well, you can cold call on somebody in there, try to make it a warm call, but don't go directly to the hiring manager. Start at somebody who's gonna maybe be at your peer level or something like that, or maybe even in a different department. And just get acquainted with somebody in there. Start working your way in where they recognize your value and they're willing to start making some introductions. Get the referrals. Use networking and referrals as your primary means of getting those conversations. Now, everything we covered tonight, except for those exercises, is covered in these two articles I published on my LinkedIn profile about a month ago. Um, I brought a business card, so if you want to grab that, or if you want to grab a screenshot, that's on there as well. Um, your resume, what is it good for, is the guidance on the first part we covered, which is how to use this thing and how not to use it. <clears throat> the other article goes into detail about how to create a compelling resume and goes into more depth on the various subsets and topics that we covered there. Are there questions? We talked about ageism a little bit. That's a big subject in itself. Yes? Coloring resumes. Color. When to use them? I got some advice from a resume writer yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Color can be used very effectively, or it can be used, it can make something horrible. If you use, I had one, I used to make software for a lot of work, right? And there was one guy in the lab who would take advantage of the fact that you could set the colors of the various elements in the, in the windows and such. And his goal was to find the ugliest, most offensive color scheme you could possibly have. And it was a fishbowl laboratory with a window that was right up against the break. And he took the light and it would, people would go to eat their lunch and get nauseated by the colors. So anyway, color can be used effectively. You can certainly make it more visually interesting than a black and white. You have to keep in mind, will how are they going to use this? Are they going to print it? Are they going to uh, feed it into a machine? If you put things in boxes and tables, a lot of times those get jumbled when they get read into a machine, scanned in. So think about how it's going to get used. If it's going to be used by a human, by all means, a nice, visually appealing layout with some colors, some graphic design, et cetera, it's a brochure. But if you're trying to just feed it into an applicant trapping system, that's a different matter. You may want to have different versions of the resume, one that's more optimized for the machines and the other one that's more optimized for the people. But don't kill yourself. The content is far more important than the layout. How do you handle gaps, particularly if the gaps are like Well, Put yourself in a position. So the question is, how do you handle gaps, especially recent travel, you. maybe personal interest, maybe we were there or something that was sitting inside of you. you have to. It creates a question. You can either avoid the question by using a functional resume structure, or you can just put it in there saying, I was here. And then you either account for it or you don't. You can put in the time and say, I took a sabbatical and went to Spain and picked grapes for for six months or whatever it was, if, if that was what turned you on. Because actually a sabbatical is now understood to be, hey, refresh your charters, get your bearings again, et cetera. It depends on the employer. I've always found actually it's a telling thing about how people respond to you 
going on the sabbatical. Mm -hmm. it tells you a lot about them. I've had people who, one of two things, oh, I wish I could do that, right? Or I have done that, and I, I really love that, I really, what did you do on yours? If the answer is not one of those two things, probably don't really want to work with you. Well, that's just it. If they're going to reject you on the basis of you having looked after your dying relative for a year and a half, and say, well, that disqualifies you from doing this job because who knows, you might have other relatives. <laughs> <laughs> if that's going to be the policy, is that a place you really want to work in anyway? You know, so you have to think about it. It's, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. So are they trying to attract the talent and what kind of a market are we in? So I have a question yeah. sort of related to that. I'm asking one of my friends is trying to help her friends. Essentially took 10 years off to be stay-at-home moms. I had just, what do you write on your resume for 10 years? I had three people come to me recently saying, getting back into the workforce after a 10 to 12 year absence. Yeah, the question is, what the heck were you doing? So one thing to do in those cases is say, stay-at-home mom. Well, what did you do? Well, you raised kids, sure. Well, what else? Oh, I organized the PTA. Oh, I ran the kids' soccer league. Uh, and organize this, that, and the other thing. Chauffeur, study. financier, <laughs> personal <laughs> assistant, well, chef. Yeah. They'll see right through that. Yeah. No, but I mean, like, literally, I have someone I know who, I, I have a friend who, she's, her husband's a, a CEO of a company, and she stays home with two kids. And let me tell you, that's how she describes herself. Yeah. It's a job. It is. It's full-time, and it's not so, paid. This is the curiosity, right? She's so it depends. It could be a tongue in cheek. It could be a tongue in cheek, and maybe that'll play well in some startup in San Francisco, and maybe that doesn't do, do so well in some place that's a little more buttoned up. You got to judge your audience. But what you can do is put in activities that you did do. I taught myself Python while the kids were asleep, or you know, I kept my hand in it in some way because they're going to want to look and say, hmm. I have a choice of hiring somebody who has done this work that I need done within the last five years, or I have this person who's just returning to the workforce and maybe their skills are rusty, I don't know. What's the evidence? So put yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager and figure out what would make them willing to consider somebody who is returning to the workforce. Some things that work are recent coursework I've done, recent volunteer activities I've done, things that show I've been demonstrating the kind of skills, or whether those be soft skills, like organizing meetings, or public speaking, or getting group activities, et cetera. Volunteerism, you know, that's, that spirit shows can do, get something done, not just sit around and watch soap operas and feed the kids Doritos or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you need to show something that the hiring manager can project you doing the job they need done. It's still going to have trouble competing against the other ones. So, like, like if your parent was like, my, my wife volunteers with like the homeschool club. Let me tell you, that like rivals any level of stakeholder management that you do as a PM. Indeed. There's nothing worse than people who aren't aren't paid to do something and trying to coordinate them. I mean, so I, I, I think I'd see that on a, on a resume as like, oh yeah, okay. You, you You've got that skill. Tell yeah. me a story. Tell me a story or two about it and you'll have the story. Tom. Have you seen uh, one thing that's specifically uh, like C3AI or other companies in space try and address this problem with something called a returnship? I'm wondering if you have run across that at all. Uh, I haven't run across too many returnships, but more, some more progressive companies are trying to do this. They're recognizing the value of employees who have been out of it for a while and are coming back in, that they have lots of deep experience, especially in some of the things that the 20-year-olds don't have. Like, hey, I've been laid off before. I've had to recover from that. Or I've had to deal with losing part of my team, having them cannibalized for some other project, and still having to have the same output that I did before I lost those people or some of these other things. So, you more mature workers, you've got to overcome a number of different perceptions out there. What are the biases that lead to ages? Shout them out. No creativity. No creativity? Can't work long hours. 
obsolete skills, expect too much money. What else? Healthcare. Healthcare, you're gonna get sick a lot. You're gonna retire too soon. Uh, oh, more qualified than me. Yes, that actually does come up. Might take my job, fear of a replacement. So your job as a mature worker is to dispel those notions, to take the overcompensation thing off the table by asking, hey, what are your concerns? And when they when you drag it out of them, it may be tough to drag it out of them, but when you drag it out of them, then you still you have a chance to speak to them. Oh, I have learned these three other lang programming languages recently, and here are some interesting projects. By the way, have you looked at my blog lately? Oh, and here's a website I created for them. And I've also got, uh, uh, I just exited a startup da -da -da -da, doing this, had a successful exit. All of a sudden, I'll tell you a quick story. I went to a meetup at uh, LinkedIn about two years ago. It was the Agile Leadership Network meetup, where the invited speaker was Jeff Sutherland, one of the fathers of Scrum, right? So I'm looking around, and the average age in the room is similar to what we see here. And this guy walks in, he looks like he's in his 70s or something like that. You can see everybody in the room is kind of going like, who's the old man? It takes me a while to realize, oh, that's our featured speaker for sure. <laughs> Oops. He gets up in the microphone and starts talking, and within one minute, everyone has forgotten about this guy's age because he is off to the races. He's got intense material, he's talking stories, he's telling us things that we're just struggling to keep up with. Got it coming rapid fire. Nobody thought about his age after that. So it's really about you getting a chance to demonstrate your skill, show what you can do, show what your accomplishments are about, and take the age equation off the table without threatening people and making them feel like you're going to be taking their jobs. <laughs> so it's a little tricky balance, but you can get there. Any other questions we uh, want to get before we close out today? What'd you learn? More concise, right? The main thing is more concise. More concise. Can you get down to a one page resume or could be two pages? Yeah, well, how many pages is okay for a resume? Two pages is okay. Three or four, you're losing attention. It shows you can't focus on the most important stuff. One, hey, Marissa Meyer has a one page resume. If you ever look at that one, go look at that one. It's got some graphics and stuff. It's an interesting one to look at. Um, the news stories we would say other things are, but you can present or something as really well. Anyway, you can do a one page here. It's okay to go to two if you have more stories to tell. So, cover letters? Cover letters. Should you use them? When do you use a cover letter? Oh, that's a good question. If you're shipping a resume in cold, sure, put a cover letter on. What's the chance it'll get read? No, it's about 40%, probably. 40 to 50%. Really? Yeah, somewhere around in there. It'll at least get skimmed. If it's too long, it won't get read. If it's three short and tight paragraphs that are really focused on what it's about, hey, the person can get to the point. Great. Maybe highlight one or two things that are in the resume that you want to pay special attention to that's relevant for this job. But again, a resume with a cover letter, you're sending that in to somebody still better to go the other way and get it to where they're asking you for the resume. And if they ask you for the resume and write a cover letter, boy, you're going to be able to refer back to things you had in the conversation already, right? And that's even better. But in general, if you're going to put the effort into submitting a resume that wasn't solicited, sure, put a cover letter. It gives you much more chance of somebody taking a glance at it because you put that extra effort in and you try to customize it a little bit. Recognize that only half of those cover letters are going to get read, but hey, 50% is better than zero. What's your thought about how much detail you have in your resume versus in your LinkedIn profile? Should you have more detail in one than the other? It depends. I, I would keep both concise. Nobody's going <clears> to <throat> want to read a lot, whether it's online or in their hand, and especially in the online format. So keep the summary on your LinkedIn profile relatively concise. Four paragraphs is fine. But you start getting much more than that, it gets to be too much. So put in your other content through things like projects that you've worked on, um, put in links to external sites, and write articles. I wrote quite a few articles by now. A uh, number of them on job search, you're welcome to read those and learn whatever you want from the information that's in there. That's 
encapsulating things I've learned over three years of career coaching. But that also gives people a window into what you're all about. Positions you a thought leader, gives you a chance to talk about actual experiences you have that are relevant so you can start digging into the accomplishments, not just in bullet form, but storytelling form. You know the power of storytelling. It's how we process things, it's how we absorb and remember things. So put in some stories and some articles. That's one of the best ways to expand out the content. And it's a little hard to do that with a resume, but on LinkedIn it's really easy. And the other thing is when you start publishing, people will notice. So these ones haven't really um, gotten a lot of traction yet, but the, net, the networking one I put up got more than 10,000 reads, more than 350 likes, and more than 100 people forwarding it. So you can start to get some visibility by doing this. And then when that hiring manager sees your resume, says, hey, you're kind of interesting, looks you up on LinkedIn, oh, there's, yeah, that corroborates the stuff I saw already. Oh, an article. Huh, let's see what thought original, original thought comes out of this person. And that's where you have a chance to really show your leadership. And then you can compose something useful and valuable and you're willing to give that to the world. It goes a long way. All right, I think uh, it's about time to wrap it up. Thanks for your participation. I hope it was uh, good use of your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim.